in part one because we still do not have the actual value for a that we can work with so we will not know the domain of f which means that we will not be able to sketch the graph of y is equal to fx so to compromise i'm going to sketch the graph of y is equal to the expression of fx only so i'm going to sketch the graph of y is equal to one over p plus x minus one square and based on what i've pressed into my calculator letting p be a value that is bigger or equal to one i've gone for the number one i've gotten a shape that is like this and based on this shape it indicates to me that there's a possibility that there's a horizontal asymptote i'm going to look at my expression for this expression when x tends to plus or minus infinity y tends to zero which further justified for me that there's a, going to be a horizontal asymptote of y is equal to zero so based on what i can see on my graphing calculator I'm going to be sketching a graph that has a horizontal asymptote. It has a maximum point, and it's going to turn back down towards the horizontal asymptote. So I have a graph that is something that is like this. When x is equal to zero, that will give me the y-intercept. And when x is equal to zero, y is equal to one over p plus minus one square. So it's one over p plus one. The thing that is tricky about this graph is actually to find a way to indicate the maximum possible point. And if you were to look at this expression, doing an algebraic analysis of this expression, we can actually deduce when this expression will be the maximum possible by working on the denominator. Because for this denominator, it is actually a quadratic expression expressed in its completed square form, x minus 1 square plus p. And if I were to actually sketch the graph of this, it is going to be a smiley face, a parabola, smiley face. And the minimum possible point here is going to happen at 1p. And this point is interesting to us because in order for this expression to be the maximum, I need the denominator to be the minimum. And the denominator is minimum when x is equal to 1 and the output is equal to p. So the denominator here is minimum when x is equal to 1. And I'm going to get the denominator here to be equal to p. And this gives rise to the maximum possible point here. When x is equal to 1, the denominator is p. This will give us the maximum possible point by making sure that the denominator is the minimum possible. And now let's look at the domain. The domain is modulus of x is supposed to be less than or equal to a. So rewriting this, I can see that x is supposed to be bigger or equal to minus a and a and yet the question says that f inverse exists so for plus and minus a it is going to be symmetrical about the y-axis so we can that we can definitely expect something that is maybe like this plus or minus a which means that this portion here is going to be representing my fx because we need fx to pass the horizontal line test and what is the maximum possible a can be the maximum possible A can be will be moving this as far out as possible, but maintaining the fact that they must be symmetrical about Y. So the furthest possible it can go is most likely going to be here. A is going to be moved all the way until the point 1, which means that on the left hand side, we are going to be reaching a minus 1. So the graph that we are going to be looking at is going to be this portion here. Okay, This portion is going to represent my graph of Fx. And by stretching A as far away from the y-axis as possible and making sure that it is symmetrical and maintaining the fact that this graph must pass the horizontal line test, we can see the maximum possible A can go is 1. So to answer part 1, we can now deduce the largest possible value for A and this is equal to 1. We are going to be making use of the value of a that we have found in part 1. So a is going to be equal to 1, which means that the domain is such that modulus of x is going to be less than or equal to 1. We can also see that the domain is going to be bigger or equal to minus 1 less than or equal to 1. So by restricting the previous graph that we have sketched in part 1 to be between minus 1 and 1, we have a shape that is like this. It is inclusive of two endpoints, so there are solid dots here. And as for the y coordinate of this point, it is when x is equal to 1. We have already found in the previous part, this is the maximum point. So the corresponding output is 1 over p. As for this, when I let x be equal to minus 1, we have a 1 over p plus minus 2 squared. So it is 1 over p plus 4. And this is the graph of y is equal to fx that we are working on. We are going to try to find now the expression for f inverse. 
And to do that, I'm going to be letting y be equal to fx. So if I were to let y be equal to fx, that means I'm going to be letting y to be equal to 1 over p plus x minus 1 squared. But fx is not just this expression. fx is also consideration of the domain, which is x is supposed to be between minus 1 and 1. Let's try to make x a subject. Cross multiplying this, we have a p plus x minus 1 squared. This is equal to 1 over y. So x minus 1 squared, it is going to be 1 over y minus p. So x minus 1 is going to be equal to plus or minus square root of 1 over y minus p. So x is equal to 1 plus or minus square root of 1 over y minus p. But x is between minus 1 and 1. So x is a number that is supposed to be smaller than 1. So we are going to be rejecting the plus because it is going to cause x to be bigger than 1. So we're going to be retaining just the 1 minus square root of 1 over y minus p. And the reason is because like what we've just mentioned, x is supposed to be between minus 1 and 1. Which means that the expression for f inverse, now we know, the expression for f inverse is going to be equal to 1 minus replacing y by x. It is 1 over x minus p. And as for the domain of f inverse, it is going to be the same as the range of f. So looking at this, what is the range? The range of f is going to be between this value and this value and inclusive of the two values. So it's going to be between 1 over p plus 4 inclusive of, so I'm using a square bracket here, and 1 over p with another square bracket here. Supposed to sketch the graph of gx and g inverse x. I've also included the line y is equal to x so that I can display the relationship between the graph of g and g inverse to be one that is symmetrical about the line y is equal to x. Next, let's try to solve the inequality where gx is supposed to be strictly bigger than g inverse x. So we are looking for the set of values of x such that gx is going to be higher than g inverse x and that happens between here and here and this is when x is 0 0.495 and this is when x is equal to 1 so from the looks of it i know that x is supposed to be between these two values 0 0.495 and 1 but i also need to try to consider the two n values let me show you what i mean so when x is equal to this number so when x is equal to 0 0.495, what happens to gx and g inverse x? I can see from here, gx is actually equal to g inverse x. So should I be including 0 0.495? I should not, because this value of x is going to not satisfy the inequality. It's going to cause gx to be equal to, but not bigger than. So I'm going to retain this strictly bigger than. But at this particular value, when x is equal to 1, when x is equal to 1, I can see that gx is going to be here, and g inverse x is going to be equal to 0. So at this point here, I can see that gx is actually strictly bigger than g inverse x. So this is a value that we want because it satisfies the inequality. So I know x must be not just less than, but less than or equal to 1. And rewriting this in the set notation, I know x are any real numbers that are in between these two values. So it's going to be between 0 0.495. It is going to be strictly bigger than and less than or equal to 1. In part 4, we are looking at the composite function g inverse f. And that means that x is first going to go into f. Then after that, it is supposed to go into g inverse so for the existence to happen, we just want to make sure that what that comes out from f is a subset of what that g is supposed to be receiving. The range of f is supposed to be a subset of the domain of g inverse. We do know what is the range of f from the previous part. We know that the range of f is going to be from 1 over p plus 4 all the way until 1 over p inclusive of the two n values. As for the domain of G inverse, we can either derive it from the range of G or I can just simply look at what I have from the graph that I've drawn in the previous part. So for G inverse, 
the domain is going to be from zero but not inclusive of zero all the way until one so this is going to be from zero to one inclusive and we are working on a value of p that is bigger or equal to one so we are going to make use of this to discuss about this number and this number if you were to look at p to be bigger or equal to one and one over p plus four since p is a positive number one over p plus four will be a positive number my aim is to try to discuss that this number is bigger than zero as for one over p if i were to just divide this across to the other side i will have one over p and this is going to be less than or equal to one so if i were to just write it properly 1 over p is supposed to be less than or equal to 1. So this number is less than or equal to 1, which means that this set of value is going to be a subset of this set of values. That's why I can now say that the range of f is a subset of the domain of g inverse. And since this happens, then I can say that the composite function g inverse f exists. Again, we are working on a composite function g inverse f. And just like what we have discussed previously, it has already been proven to be existing. So the composite function exists, first x goes into f, then after that g inverse. And now what we are interested in is to find what that comes out from g inverse f. What is the range of g inverse f? And to do so, my strategy will be this. I'm going to look at the last function here. So I'm going to be looking at this last function, which is g inverse. And if I were to look at the domain of g inverse, the domain of g inverse is supposed to be between 0 to 1 inclusive of 1. But in a composite function, what that goes into g is not 0 to 1. What that goes into g is what that comes out from f. So what that goes into g, what that comes out from f, the range of f is 1 over p plus 4 all the way until 1 over p so this is a set of value that is going to g inverse with when it is in the composite function and if i were to let this goes into g inverse what comes out is going to be the range of g inverse f so let's try this and to get this i will first need the expression for g inverse so to get the expression for g inverse i'm going to let y be equal to g x so y is going to be equal to e to the power of minus square root of x, such that x is supposed to be bigger or equal to 0. So ln y is going to be equal to minus square root of x. Square root of x is going to be minus ln y. x is going to be equal to minus ln y square, which is actually just going to be ln y square. So I know the expression for g inverse g inverse x is going to be ln of x squared. So now this set of values goes into g. Looking at the graph of g inverse, I can see that these two sets of value, so let's say I have a 1 over p plus 4 here, and let's say the other one, 1 over p. Let's say I have a number that is here. So, so this is going to be inserted into the graph of g inverse. And that means this is going to give me all the possible output. It is going to be big or equal to, it's going to be big or equal to. So my aim now is to find what is this corresponding output. Because this output here is going to give me the range of G inverse F. So I'm going to let these two values go into G inverse. So for G of 1 over P plus 4. This is equal to ln of 1 over p plus 4 squared g inverse so i'm substituting this back into g inverse expression so this is going to be minus ln of p plus 4 squared which i can also write this as just ln of p plus 4 squared then substituting this value into g inverse g inverse of 1 over p this is equal to ln of 1 over p square, which is minus ln of p square, which I can also write it as ln p square. So looking at these two values, this is going to be substituting 1 over p in. This is going to be ln p square. And as for this value, 
it is going to be ln p plus 4 squared. So what is going to be the range of the composite function g inverse f? This is going to be between these two values and inclusive of the two values. So it is going to be ln p squared all the way until ln p plus 4 squared.